because you guys wanted arms. So I created a pair of arms for your guide that are optional. So if you want to add those little cartoony arms on there, you've got that. And then there's also a tree that I'm not going to use this month, but it'll be used in the subsequent month. Then we have the pineapple house and the pineapple house is a summer house. So my pineapple house is made with a fun uh, fabric that looks like a pineapple. And so you should have all of these little bits in your pattern pack. And so, hi everybody. All right, just let me know if you can hear me because this is brand new, uh, trying to use two cameras so that you can see my hands and I don't have to keep moving my other camera. So I have all of my pattern pieces and I'm gonna begin uh, this lesson by recapping what we've done really quickly in the last two lessons. So in lesson one, um, I taught you guys how to do fusible and my method of fusible involved um, tracing your patterns and then cutting out the middle so that you only have a little bit of fusible on the outside but none in the center. The next uh, skill that we learned in February was how to do a starch method for smooth edge applique. And if you guys remember from February, this is my little birdhouse. So my rustic little birdhouse, um, I decided instead of stitching it down by hand that I was just gonna quickly um, stitch it with a single stitch, not a blanket stitch all the way around. And then I uh, did a little bit of rustic looking embroidery to add a little bit of detail to my birdhouse. And as you guys can see, I did like a blanket stitch by hand. Then I have my little mushroom that's going to go over here. And I'm not done with him because I'm going to add a little skinny tree over here on the side. And so he will get finished up as I go along. So that was in February. In February, we also had a pair of delightful uh, boy and girl gnomes. So these are mine. And I'm gonna talk about Fabio and Felicia, right? So if you look, I'm gonna bring this way down so you can see. Fabio and Felicia are fused, but they're fused with only a single stitch all the way around. So I don't do a blanket stitch on mine because I don't like switching colors a lot. And so what I do to mine is I started with pink and I did up here and I started here with my stitching. I stitched around the speech bubble and then came here and I stitched all the way around his hat. And then I uh, secured my thread. And when I got here, I jumped over and stitched all the way around and around the braids and around the arms before breaking my thread and switching from a pink to a green, which I did all of the feet with a green. And then last, I did uh, like an ivory for the noses and the beard. And so whenever I do raw edge applique, I always do a single uh, needle stitch. I don't do a blanket stitch. And I think it leaves a, a nice clean look to Fabio. So this is Fabio and Felicia. And uh, they're in love, so they have a love bubble. And that's what we've done so far, okay? Uh, somebody said, could I move my circle um, to the left? So how about I move my images to the right? So there you go. So this is all new for me, so I'm learning along with you guys. So this is the recap. So this is February, right? I made a birdhouse because this is a filler block. And then I also have January behind me and I have the house from January. So that's where we are right now. So let's talk about this project. So for me, my project is going to be uh, a block 
that's going to be sash. So if you notice, every one of my blocks finishes 10 and a half this way by 12 and a half this way, which means that I am going to be using my jelly roll strips that were in the getting started. So I have a set of rainbow jelly roll strips. I'm gonna use all of these for my sashing. So my sashing is gonna change depending on the birthstone of the little creatures that I've got. And so this is what I'm using my sashing for. To attach the sashing to each of my pieces, I attach as I go. So for example, these guys are gonna have a pale purple sashing. And so what I will do is I will cut a piece of sashing that's the same width as the top of my block, which is 10 and a half inches. I will cut a two and a half inch square for this corner right here. And I will sew along this line. And I will leave that as a unit. Then on this side, I will sew a single piece all the way down the side and then I will lay this on top and join it this way. So I sew this one by itself on the side and then I sew this to the top with this square, two and a half inch square attached. So each of my blocks will end up with sashing on two sides but not everywhere. So if you notice up here, I have sashing on two sides and I add them as I go. So I will put this over here to the side and I will sash this at the very end for you guys to see. All right, so let's talk about needle turn. So today, the applique lesson is all about needle turn. And needle turn is a method of applique that enables you to use a needle and thread. And there's a couple of different methods for needle turn. One method is with freezer paper and another method is simply with uh, the fabric itself. So I'm going to be using the little birdhouse as my needle turn example. So I'm going to start by sharing what I'm going to do for my final piece. So if you notice, I pinned the little uh, mushroom on here and I usually use my little teeny tiny applique pins because those stay in place and they're out of my way when I sew all the way around. So I typically just use my little tiny applique pins and as you can see, they uh, stay out of the way. You can press with these. You can sew with your sewing machine around if you want to. And so I like to use my little tiny applique pins for any time that I'm doing applique. And these are sold in lots of places. They're called Dritz um, applique pins and they're dipped, so that means it's like a little ceramic tip. And you can press right over that and leave it right where it's at so you can sew right around those. So let's talk about hand applique. My favorite method for hand applique is smooth edge, right? And so today, this is smooth edge, but today I'm going to show you needle turn. And so in this little uh, block I have a birdhouse but this is a summer birdhouse so I want to add an artichoke garden to mine and so the very first thing that I'm going to do when I needle turn is I'm going to find in this case what I'm going to add down here is artichokes in front of my little birdhouse and maybe over here in the garden is I'm going to find an artichoke that fits my little birdhouse and so I'm going to take and I'm gonna fussy cut one of these artichokes so that it's a little bit bigger than what I need. And by fussy cut, I mean just add a little bit of fabric around my finished piece like this. So I'm just gonna kinda cut it like this. For needle turn applique, I always wash my fabric really, really well. And I put no starch on it whatsoever. 
So for needle turn, I never put starch. If you notice how soft that is, that makes needle turn very easy, right? So needle turn very easy. So this is a, a little artichoke that I want. I think I'm gonna put it down here. And maybe I'll add another artichoke that's not quite so big. So in raw edge applique, in raw edge applique, you cut the pieces exactly the size that you want them. But with needle turn, you cut the pieces a little bit bigger and you can, you need at least, uh, I would say a fourth of an inch, maybe a little bit bigger. But when I needle turn applique, I always add um, about three eighths of an inch to my pieces just so you know. So if you noticed on the patterns, it'll say for needle turn applique at 3 eighths of an inch. So I've got a couple of pieces and I will just cut out, I'll fussy cut some of these, maybe one that's a little bit um, bigger and I will maybe get one that's a little bit smaller. Now what happens to the other little artichokes that I have? Those other little artichokes will end up being uh, fused to another block. So I'm not wasting any of these little artichokes. And I love novelty uh, prints because they're fun for applique. Does anybody have any questions about needle turn as I get ready to prep my needle and get started? So step one, wash your fabric. Make sure that it has no um, make sure that it has no starch whatsoever and that it's been very uh, pressed very well. So I steam it and I press it. For needle turn applique, I use this thing called Thread Magic. It's just a thread conditioner. Uh, some people use beeswax, but it's a, like a little bit of a silicone and it enables my needle and thread to glide through my fabric. Okay, so I'm gonna be using Thread Magic. I'm also going to be using silk thread for this project. And I usually buy silk thread in like three or four colors, white, ivory, red, and black. I'm gonna be using this green because it matches the edges of my little artichoke, so I'm gonna move those. And I'm gonna show you what this is. So this is just 100%, I don't know if it'll focus, silk thread. If not, I'll put it over here. Can you guys see that? It's just 100% silk thread. It's very, very fine and very, very thick, very thin. So it's one of my favorite threads for needle turn applique. And of course, you need needles. Uh, my favorite needle for needle turn is what's called a straw needle or also known as a sharp. So it's kind of long and thin. So I'll pick it out of here and of course I'm going to have to use a threader because, well, can I get that out of there? Those magnets like to hang on tight to those needles. All right. So this is what I'm going to be sewing. Let me move it out of the way. All right, so my birdhouse has a little garden that I'm going to put down here in the front. And so now I'm ready. Yes, silk thread is 100 weight. So if you notice, it's, it's silk 100. And it's very, very fine. Compared to regular thread, it's ultra thin. And so I'm going to pull um, a strand of silk. And silk is a very strong thread. So maybe a strand that's about 12 inches. So about 12 inches long, single thread, not double, because I want it to be almost invisible. So I'm gonna pull a single strand and I'm gonna have to use my glasses, friends, because my eyes are not what they used to be. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna thread my needle. Let's see if I can do it without my, uh, my needle threader. I might get lucky. 
and I got lucky. I've read it that the first time. And so I'm using a single strand of 100% silk thread and I'm going to make a knot at the bottom. How I make a knot at the bottom is by bringing the end towards the needle like this and then I'm going to pinch this end of my thread and I'm going to roll it three times. And pull it all the way through. And what that does, it is it makes a perfect little tiny knot. So can you see that? It's a little tiny knot down here at the bottom. And now I'm ready to begin my needle turning. So like I said, washed and dried and pressed. No starch. And I have a little bit of a margin. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to decide where one of my artichokes is going to be in this little garden. And this artichoke is going to be right here. And I could baste that if I wanted to, to hold it in place. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to use a couple of really small pins and I'm going to hold those in place. And some people are basters, other people are not, but that'll hold my artichoke exactly where I want. And now begin, begins the fun. I'm going to run my thread across a little bit of this thread conditioner. So I'm going to take my thread, press it down with my finger and just pull that silk thread across that thread conditioner. And what that does is it keeps my thread from getting tangled. And this is a silicone, so it doesn't leave a bunch of goo. Some people use beeswax, um, but I use this thread magic and it's made with a little bit of silicone. So it helps your thread to keep it from tangling and it helps it to glide right through the fibers. Okay, so let's start with our very first artichoke. So the first thing that I'm going to do when I needle turn is I'm going to need a good pair of applique scissors. So little tiny applique scissors and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to trim away a little tiny section of my fabric. So I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to trim away. And I'm going to work one tiny section at a time. So if you notice, I'll come in with my, with my scissor and I'll snip just a tiny bit. And I'll make another little snip right here. Not too close. I leave about a sixteenth of an inch. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to tuck that underneath my fabric. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to push it back just like that. And I'm going to turn it, which is why it's called needle turn, with my needle. I'm going to push. And so it creates a little margin. Let's see if you can see that. And I'm going to come from the back to the front. And I'm going to take itty bitty, teeny tiny stitches. And let me know if you can see my hands okay. And so as I come through, I take a tiny bite. I travel about an eighth of an inch along that edge. And then I take another little tiny bite and I push it through. So no, I do not put anything on the back of my fabric, I simply take a little teeny tiny and almost invisible stitch right in that little seam. So where I'm sewing is where that fabric is folded right along that edge is where I'm coming from the back to the front and I'm taking a little tiny stitch and I'm traveling kind of sideways just a tiny bit and then I'm coming right back and I'm stitching it. And so what that's doing is that it's making a little teeny tiny invisible stitch 
that you can't see. And like I said, you leave at least an eighth of an inch of extra fabric and then you, you clip it in little segments. Does anybody have any questions about what I'm working on? Oh, can I zoom in more? Here, let me try to bring my second camera back down. Is that better? Can you guys see that? And I'm gonna give that camera just a second to autofocus. Can you guys see that? And so what I'm doing is I'm taking little tiny stitches. I'm going into the back and coming up just barely underneath that crease. And now I've stitched across this little segment. Can you guys see what I'm doing? All right, so now I'm gonna take, and I've got a little curve right here. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna snip another little sec section right here and I'm gonna take a little snip and I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna hold my fingernail right here against the seam and I'm gonna push it back like this. So I'm tucking it in. And if I tuck it too much, I can pull a tiny bit out with my needle like this, but I've tucked it in. And so now I'm going straight back, just barely underneath the artichoke to the back. And I'm coming in right there where that starts to curve and I'm gonna take a tiny little stitch. And like I said, I'm coming in from the back and I'm sewing in right here where that crease is. And I'm kind of pulling it tight and I take a little tiny stitch right over to the next section. and I keep pushing that back. And so I'm gonna keep pushing with my needle, which is why it's called needle turn, the edge of that fabric, and I'm gonna tuck it in with my needle every time. I'm gonna pinch it with my thumb, and I'm gonna come through here, and I'm gonna add another little tiny stitch. And if you notice, even though I'm coming a little bit to the front, when I pull that silk thread, it looks absolutely invisible and you cannot see the edges. And I do trim as I go. And so by doing that, it leaves no bulk in the seams and it also makes this very manageable. A lot of people are scared of needle turn. They think needle turn is hard, but needle turn is easy if you take it in little segments just like this. So now I'm gonna do the same. I'm coming around this curve. And this is a very small piece, right? And I'm gonna take and I'm gonna make a little snip, just like that. And so now I have this little segment and I'm gonna push it underneath, just like that. And now I'm gonna give it a tug, just like this. And so what that does is it, it sinks that little tiny bit of thread in the applique. If you notice, I'm holding it with this finger and I'm pulling so that it makes it snug. And then I'm going underneath kind of at an angle and I'm coming back up about an eighth of an inch away, a, a tiny, tiny nibble. And I'm sewing about a sixteenth of an inch every time. Sometimes I make a little knot like that one. So I traveled to here and I made a little knot where I knotted the um, thread. And the reason I did that is to secure that. So if you were to walk away from your needle turn, 
then you could um, not worry about it coming loose. And so that's what I do. I just keep going until I finish going all the way around my piece. Now some people will baste, like I said, there are little pieces. It's called back basting. You can baste them from the back. But I find that step is, is actually not necessary because I just do it this way. And so I'm going to show you how to go around the curve, how to come to a point and then come around the curve a couple more times, okay? And like I said, silk thread makes this task super easy. If you come out too far, just back up your needle and, and try it again. But you don't need a thimble and you don't need any special equipment if you use uh, fabric that's been washed and not starched. So a lot of times when I wash my fabric, I don't starch it so that I can use it for whatever project I want. And then I starch it if it's necessary. All right, so there we go. I've come around this corner, right? I've needle turned this segment. I've needle turned this segment. And I'm going to come back around the corner. So let me pull this over. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Can you guys see that? Is that better? It says, when you snip the fabric, does the fabric ever fray on the snip? Um, I snip, so it does if your fabric is a low density fabric, so if it doesn't have a tight weave, it can fray. That's why I don't snip um, in anything that's gonna be exposed. So for example, here where I've already stitched along this area, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna snip, but not all the way to my design. I'm gonna snip about a 16th of an inch away. So I'm gonna snip right here. And these segments are about a fourth of an inch that I'm snipping. And I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna push that fabric underneath itself, just like that. And this is why it's called needle turn, because you're taking your needle and you're turning that fabric under like this, and you're pushing it under there. And if the pin gets in your way, you can take it off. But as you can see, I'm literally folding it and bringing it back. So I'm turning it with my needle and shoving the extra seam allowance underneath. I'm pinching it with my fingernail. And that allows me to take a bunch of little tiny stitches right along that edge. Now needle turn applique is a great way to do what I'm doing right here, which is like fussy. Sew something in place because this is kind of hard to do. See this curvy little artichoke? That's really hard to make it look pretty when you're, um, when you're doing um, any kind of machine stitching. So if you're doing a blanket stitch, you know, like when you're doing the beard, it makes it really hard to get really fine, tiny details when you're using your sewing machine. So sometimes when I'm embellishing or adding little windows or little doors, or extra details, I simply just sew it by hand. So if you notice, it's laying nice and smooth along that edge. And so my artichoke will sit inside its little garden. And I just snip right there. And I'm going to push that under like this. I'm going to remove the bits. 
And I'm going to fold it under just like that. So I want to go the opposite direction. So I take and I finger crease it. And typically when I finger crease it, that just holds it in place. Some people will use a tiny iron and press that. But I'm literally just going to take now this little tiny bit and I'm going to tuck it with my needle. Like I said, this is why it's called needle turn. Because you're just stuffing it in there with your needle and then you're sewing it down. So you're holding it and you're coming in like at a 45 degree angle and you're giving it a little bit of a tug and it gives it that nice shape around that curve for that little artichoke. It comes to a point and then it curves around. So like I said, every single month that you tune in, I will have a different applique skill. So this skill is called needle turn. It's a form of a smooth edge applique. Another type of smooth edge applique is what we did last month and it was done with starch. But there are lots and lots of methods for applique and this is one of them. And I love this one for adding tiny details to my applique. So you're going to see as we go, I'm going to add birds, I'm going to add flowers, uh, butterflies, and all kinds of little things to my gnome garden. And when I do, for those little tiny details, I will probably do needle turn. Like I said, you just tuck it. I came back. I'm going to backtrack a tiny bit because I took stitches that were slightly too big. So you just backtrack a tiny bit, if you will. And you go through here. And this is very relaxing. It's something that you can do when you're waiting at the doctor's office, if you're on your lunch break. Um, don't do this at church. You're supposed to be listening to the sermon, but I cannot confirm or deny that I've done this during a church service. All right, and so I backtracked to make sure that I don't have a frayed edge. And so now my little artichoke edge is looking like that. Do you guys see that? Little tiny stitches. So this is needle turn, right? It's not scary. Like some people assume that needle turn applique is this really scary, time-consuming process, but it's actually not. And like I said, it's a great way to add fun little details to your gnome quilt. So even if this block refused, um, and in the case of this one, this block is stitched by machine, you can still come in and do a mix and match and add other little details. So a lot of times people are, are terrified of needle turn and they think they can't do it, but you can. So now I'm going to tunnel my way back where over here to where the artichoke turns and now I'm ready to continue. And I did that just to make sure that I didn't have any little bits of fabric sticking out and I had a nice smooth edge right along that edge. All right, so let me continue. Like I said, see where I have this extra fabric? I've just folded it underneath, taken my fingernail, and literally just finger pressed it like this. And I will continue stitching. So for those of you who've done needle turn applique, do you have some pointers you would like to share in the chat? Are there any pointers that you would like to share with the rest of us in the chat? And like I said, you can always take a little bit more of this silicone. This is called Thread Magic. I love it. I don't own stock in Thread Magic, but I like it because it makes my thread very smooth. It glides right through my fabric. And then if I need to thread my needle again, like I just did, makes it easy to thread. So 
So this, my friends, is an introduction to the scary world of needle turn. Some people are terrified of needle turn. So if you missed the beginning, um, in the beginning I talked about how I finished my February block, which was a single needle stitch. So you don't have to have a fancy sewing machine. I have a few sewing machines because I'm addicted to sewing machines. And so if you notice uh, my thread right there, it frayed just a tiny bit because that's what happens when you've been using thread over time. And so it wants me to use a needle threader, which is fine. For those of us whose eyes are starting to fail a little bit, a needle threader is a fabulous tool. There we go. And so like I said, I pull about 12 inches of thread and then I work my way around. I always clip the curves and the straightaways and I come in from the back to the front. Just stick your needle just barely underneath that edge of that folded fabric and bring it up. And what it does is it makes a nice smooth nearly invisible stitch it's a little teeny tiny kind of like a ladder stitch right along that edge and see i'm turning it so if you don't want to snip it you can turn and then when it, the bulk gets to be too much then you can stop and take another little snip I love how this little artichoke is turning out. He's looking pretty good. His little curvy edges are looking really smooth. If you have been working on this project and you're gonna do the entire thing with needle turn, I have a couple of pointers, especially for the curvy hats. Okay, so there you can see I've got those little edges and so my little artichoke is going to end up with just a little tiny, it's little curvy pieces now. Let's see if it'll zoom in. So it has little tiny curved edges now. Let me turn this off. There. So it's got little tiny curved edges and it'll go all the way around and it'll be a little artichoke sitting in my garden. And so when I'm done, you're not gonna see any of this black, you're just gonna see a little tiny border all the way around. Does anybody have any questions about what I've shared so far about needle turn applique? Okay, so here are some pointers. When you go into a curve like this and it comes into a point, um, I, that's where I snip. So whenever I take a snip, I would snip, and let me show you with a, a silver pencil. So if you're gonna be snipping like I did, you're gonna come in and you're gonna snip anytime that the fabric dives in like this. So right there where that fabric comes into a point on an inside curve, that's where I snip and I would snip right there towards that little point and I would snip right there and I would snip right there and I would snip right there. Does that make sense? Right here where it comes to a point, I would snip right there if I needed to, if I thought there was too much bulk and I couldn't fold it underneath. But when, when I typically do my needle turn, I snip in these little points right here, kind of going out as a radius but I stop about a sixteenth of an inch in, okay? The size needles that I use for applique are called straw needles, and uh, sometimes I use sharps. So like these are sharps, and they are a size, uh, it says TAM7. You see that? 
So it's a size seven sharp. So I like them kind of long and thin and sharp. And that helps you to turn all those little pieces. So that, my friends, is how you needle turn applique. And you would just go all the way around. I would snip here. Like I said, not all the way down, so you leave a little margin. And a little tiny bit right there, just like that. A little tiny bit right here. I would get rid of some of this bulk because it's too much of a seam right there. It's big. And you're not leaving any cut edges exposed. And so you just snip a little. That seems a little bit big there. And so that, my friends, is how I prepare my little pieces for needle turn applique. So how do you get a sharp point at the top of a roof? Um, one of the things that I did is um, I have, um, are you talking about needle turn applique or are you talking about fusible? Because fusible, in order to get sharp points, I simply sew like this with a, a straight needle and go down. Um, but with needle turn, to get a really sharp point, um, like right here in this segment, I would just fold it like this to one side and then come in and fold it to the other side like this so that the tip is super sharp. So if I wanted a really sharp tip like that, and then I would, I would remove that bulk right there and then I would sew it into a nice sharp corner. Does that make sense? Okay, so the roof I have right here comes to a pretty sharp point. And I did this one with um, I did this one with starch. So if you notice, um, this one has a little bit more dimension than it would if it were with fusible because I turned all of these edges under and then I stitched the entire thing down. So this is how uh, I did this block, okay? This block here also has a little mushroom. If you notice, this mushroom has everything pressed back with these giant seams because I did this with the starch method. And so you can mix and match your techniques. Okay, so that is all for needle turn. Does anybody have a, a question about needle turn applique? If you hear echo, you may have more than one window open. I had that earlier, I had to close all my windows. Okay, so now that I have all of this, I'm gonna show you how to put together uh, the rainbow because the rainbow is a little bit tricky in this particular set. So are there any more questions about uh, needle turn applique or how to add details? Okay, it says the March Gnome beard and the house had sh such sharp edges. It's hard to use fusible interfacing to turn those. Okay, so let's talk about those sharp edges. I do not use fusible interfacing. I use fusible web whenever there's something that has very sharp edges. And so let me show you uh, that. So there's different applique methods are for different techniques right and for my fusible web is what I use when I have sharp points so let's look at this pineapple house right so this pineapple house has some really really sharp points that go up like this and so for pineapple house I chose to use fusible web I could do needle turn or I could do fusible web but I would probably not do interfacing method for this particular uh, item because it just it makes it too fussy right so for this particular um, item I've done fusible web on the back of the pineapple I've done fusible on the grass and this is the top of the pineapple house I also have 
a piece of fusible for the door, but I might be using a lime for that door. So depending on what I decide to do, I may use a lime, and so I may change the shape of that door, okay? So let's talk about the pineapple and how he goes. So the pineapple has a base. I'm gonna fold this and I'm gonna mark it at about the half inch mark. And I'm gonna put my lower grass just above that line, like we did before. We iron the, uh, the paper. Inter and this is not interfacing, this is fusible web, which is different, it has glue. And so then this would get attached to the bottom. I would make sure that I have about an equal amount on either side, so that looks pretty good. I'm using the marks on my mat, and I'm centering that, and then I pin it down before I fuse it. So before I, I fuse anything, I pin it down. Now, if I have what's called a composite where I have lots of different pieces, I could actually pre-fuse these together and then bring them all over here and fuse them. And how you would do that is by using plain parchment paper, like the kind you have in your kitchen, that you put on a cookie sheet. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I always keep just a piece of plain parchment paper that's been folded in half. And I can actually take all of these pieces before I put them down here and I can pre-fuse them together. And by pre-fuse, I mean I can attach this piece to this piece, just like this. If I decide that's how I want it, and I could fuse that together. And so the glue does not stick to the parchment paper. I just let it cool a second. Will somebody do me a favor and report the spammer that we have in the chat? And so now that is attached, see? So that is attached, and now I can remove the paper from the second one in a segment, not the entire thing. I'm gonna remove it off of this little segment here. And I'm gonna attach the top of the pineapple to this section. And so what I'm doing here is I'm creating a single item and then I can fuse wherever I want it. And so this is just a different method for doing fusible applique. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna line it up where I want it. I'm leaving this paper on the pineapple intact because I'm gonna remove it right before I fuse the entire pineapple. But I wanna center that where I want it, just like that. And I'm going to take and I'm just going to fuse right at the top. And I let it cool. And now I have a composite and I'm ready to take this entire piece now and put it wherever I want on my quilt and fuse it. Some people find that this is easier. And so this is literally Baker's parchment paper. It has no wax, nothing. You put it on the, I always label it so I know what I've got. You put it on the bottom of a cookie sheet when you're baking. And so they're great for making these composite uh, fusibles. And so for my composite fusible, I'm going to use the little pineapple house. And I'm going to do like this. I'm going to center my design by folding it in half and folding it in half. And so that's the middle now. And so I can center my pineapple right down the middle. 
And I love how that looks, right? So this pineapple house is, is gonna be nice and soft because it has doesn't have a bunch of fusible in the center. And I'm gonna take and I'm gonna remove this bit right here. So now I'm ready to take the paper off. And so now that I know where I want that pineapple, right there. Now I can come in and I can give my pineapple a good little press. Here, and I'm gonna test it. And I don't press a lot when I fuse um, because I want the option, if I have to, to lift that up and reposition it if I need to. But I just press it lightly. If you press too much, you can kill the glue. And so that's my pineapple. Uh, my pineapple is going to get a few details. So she's going to get a little bit of a, a few dots in the middle. You know how pineapples have their little, their little uh, whatever those things are, those eyes. So I'm going to put a few little dots on mine. And I think that pineapple is going to look pretty good. And so there's my pineapple, and she's ready for a little skinny tree. So I can do a skinny tree. Um, I can improv and make another tree, but I think I'm gonna wait because I have a palm tree that I'm adding to my summer gnomes, and I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna put a palm tree on this one. So she's gonna get a palm tree, and this little pineapple is gonna get set aside for now, okay? And someone asked me, do I, will I do hand sewing around this pineapple? This pineapple will have some hand sewing, but more than likely I'm gonna sew it just like I did this one and just like I did this one, which is just a straight needle, single needle, single stitch all the way around. If you notice the little feet, if you notice around, that is just a single needle, single stitch, nothing fancy. And so pineapple is going to get set aside. I will be working on this guy over the next week or so. And let's talk about our friend James. Oh, for those who are wondering, this is the Christmas tree that was in February. And see how he's got a nice sharp point and I've already stitched him down. I have not uh, sewn this down because I'm gonna put presents underneath this Christmas tree and probably uh, my baby Nate is gonna sit somewhere over here. So baby Nate's gonna be sitting in front of this Christmas tree and so I'm not done with this little guy either. All right, so let's talk about James. James has a pot of gold, right? James has a little pot of gold that goes on his block. And so his pot of gold has a little bit of gold tucked in and it comes in from the back. So if I were fusing, I would fuse from the rainbow to the pot. So you fuse the things that are in the background first and then you fuse the things that are in the foreground second. You can also take things like the little um, four leaf clover and you can fuse those together just like I did on the parchment paper even before you do anything else. So before I do anything, I can simply take my piece of parchment paper, I can remove this and just fuse the details right on top. And so this is interesting because it has a lot of pieces. And I'm gonna show you how to create the rainbow because the rainbow has a few little tricks. And so here's the little pot of gold, right? It still has the paper attached to the fusible. And I'm gonna put my four leaf clover right here kind of in the corner. And I'm gonna go ahead and fuse him down. 
yes, I'm going to be drawing a palm tree. So there you go. James has arms, if you notice. When I did his arms, I did not cut out fingers. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. I made like little mitten looking hands. So these are James's hands. That handsome devil, Mr. James. And so there's a little pot of gold that's going to sit with James. And this is his belt. If you notice, the belt had a belt buckle. I made the belt bigger because what I do sometimes is I will take and I will cut the piece slightly larger than what I want. And then I fuse them together just like I did this. And then I come back and I trim him to make sure that all of my pieces are the correct size. See there, I left a little bit extra on either side. Uh, for parchment paper, you can get a uh, Teflon pressing sheet. They have them, they're extremely inexpensive. Uh, Amazon has them, so if you can't find parchment paper, you can use a Teflon pressing sheet. And I have one like this that I paid just a few dollars for. And, and so I can use this one as well. So there's James's uh, clothes. There's his little belt. And I'm gonna take his belt. And I'm not gonna attach that until I decide where his arms are gonna go. Because what I want is for his arms to sit on his belt, like this, kind of behind his shirt. And I want his arms to come over here like this. So I'm gonna kind of wait until I decide where I want it because I want him to kind of grab his belly. Does that make sense? He's got big arms, look at him, James does. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull the paper back on just a portion of the hands, not the complete things. So I'm gonna pull just a part of the of the paper, not all of it, just the part that I want to fuse. Like this. And I'm going to leave the other stuff there because it kind of protects the glue. Just like that. Kind of decide where his little hands are going to go. That looks pretty good. I want my gnome to look muscular, so if you want him to be more muscular, you can bring his arms out and his hands in. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here, starting with his thumb. I'm going to remove the paper, but not all of it. And I wait until I'm ready to fuse the entire guy before I remove all of the paper. That just kind of protects the glue a little bit. So like I said, trace, leave a little tiny bit extra. And so now I'm gonna get those arms where I want them. Sometimes I even pin. I think I kinda like how they look just like that. I've made them so you can adjust the arms. And like I said, I don't cut their fingers out. And now I'm gonna give it a little press just a light pressing, not heavy. And what that does is that uh, creates a single applique and then I still have paper, if you notice, on this part of the arm, this part of the arm, and right here, and I will remove that right before I adhere the entire piece. I'm glad you guys like uh, my little gnome blocks. Here we go. Here's James's beard. James is a handsome Irish fellow. I will leave a little bit extra 
on the top part where it has the little polka dots where I trace that because I want to make sure that it's going to fit underneath his hat. So that is my little James guy. Okay, so this is how I put together my pieces. And when I cut, I come in from the side and stop so that I don't have a segment right here that, that has an extra cut that could fray on me. So I come and I stop, and I come from the other side and I stop. I come from this side and stop. And I use a very tiny scissor. I love these little guys. These are my little Tula Pink uh, duck bills. They're not expensive. Don't spend a million dollars on supplies if you don't have to. There you go. If you don't like how that beard looks, just add a little snip. And so that's what his little spiky beard looks like. My James has a reddish brown beard. Your James could be a blonde or a brunette or any color you want your James to be. But his beard is kind of scraggly. And so I'm glad that you guys like the little gnomes and you guys are having a good time. My granddaughter wants me to make a million gnomes, she said, because she loves them. I guess she watches a cartoon that has gnomes in it and a recent version of Snow White that was on the internet had gnomes, so my granddaughter's obsessed with gnomes. Yes, Baby Nate is the gnome at the end of the February pattern. All right. So if you notice, I just come in and just snippy snip. Like I said, I always leave that center without fusible. And so there's his scraggly little beard. And so there's my guy. And he has a curvy hat. And so I'm going to build him on this Teflon sheet or this piece of parchment paper. I'm going to take and I'm going to remove just the paper where his beard touches his body. So I'm gonna look right here and I see that I have a little curve. So I'm gonna come in right here and I'll remove just partially the paper. And like I said, not all of it because I don't wanna accidentally put him in the wrong place. And so this gives me a lot of um, freedom to place him how I want. So now I see that his beard is like this And I'm going to lay that little beard just above his arms, like this. And I'm going to give him a little press. Yes, this guy would be great with Snow White. Uh, it says, are the gnomes based on people you know or have you given them backstories? Actually, they are. Uh, my husband's name is James, and uh, there's some Irish in him. And so all of my little gnomes are based on people that I know. And so, yeah, they all have a little backstory. So this one here, I'm going to pinch it right there. And I'm going to pull back, not all of it, but part of it. And this is how I build what's called a composite fusible. And the reason he's a composite is so that I can decide where I want to fuse him, and then I'll remove the remaining paper off of him. So James has a nice little hat like this. It fits right over his beard. And then I give it a light press right where those two connect. And so now I'm gonna let that cool down just a minute and I can peel it off of that Teflon. It peels off of the parchment a whole lot better, but I can peel that off of that Teflon and I can fuse that now as a composite. So 
See, so now I still have paper on all of this and I'll be able to fuse him down. So parchment is my favorite. If it doesn't lay the way you like it, tap it with the iron, quickly move it, and there he goes. Now he's laying flat the way I like. So there's my little guy that I'm building. So what about all of the stripes, right? The pattern had little stripes on James. If I want to, I could come in here and I could actually sew some stripes down or I could needle turn or I can applique with fusible some of those little stripes. And I haven't decided if I'm gonna do that, but I think I will. And so there's, uh, there's the little gnome, there's the little kettle, and I'm gonna show you how to do the rainbow because the rainbow is a little bit tricky, right? So let me move James out of the way, the happy gnome and that Teflon sheet. And let's talk about that rainbow. So let me get the pattern out of here. And let's talk about this rainbow piece here. Okay. So if you notice, the rainbow comes in two pieces, right? Because the rainbow fits in a bend. So it comes and it bends over. So it has an arch, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of fusible and we're going to give this rainbow some life. But the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a piece of interfacing. So I'm going to take regular lightweight interfacing and I'm going to grab my little bucket full of stuff. And this is that ultra sheer fusible interfacing. And so I'm gonna take a piece of this, and I used this before. And I'm gonna take a piece of this. And if you notice, I'm gonna trace it with the bumpy side down, right? So the bumpy side is down and I'm gonna take a little pencil and I'm gonna lightly mark like this. And I can see the markings just barely and I'm gonna cut a piece of interfacing out to go with the top part of that rainbow. because I'm gonna make a composite for that rainbow as well, but I'm gonna fuse it onto interfacing before I put fusible on him, before I do anything to him, I'm gonna cut a little bit of interfacing. And I don't know if you can see that, so let me move these things out of the way. You guys see that? I have a little bit of interfacing. I'm gonna cut a little bit of interfacing bumpy side down for all of these guys. going to kind of rough cut around it. Okay, so I got two pieces of interfacing. I'm going to move this pile out of my way. I guess I'll just chuck it for now. I'll pick it up later. And I've got two pieces. So this is going to actually go on the back side of my rainbow pieces because I, I trimmed it out bumpy side down smooth side up. The bumpy side has the glue. So now I'm going to take and I have to find fabric that I like for a rainbow. I have jelly roll strips in all of these colors so I can make my rainbow solid, which I think I will. Or if I wanted to, I could snip pieces off of this jelly roll because this one has purple and my rainbow should really have purple, but Maybe not. 
So let's just look at this rainbow. I'm gonna start with red. I'm gonna go orange, yellow, some type of green, and then teal and then this bluey color. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some of the fusible interfacing and I'm gonna lay it down and I'm gonna create a composite here. So I'm gonna trace these. Like this. When I trace these, I'm going to leave a margin on either side of this. So I'm gonna go like this. And I'm gonna leave a margin on the other side because these are all gonna end up overlapped. So this is one piece of the rainbow. I'm going to slide this over and I'm going to cut this like this. Can you guys see where I'm tracing? You don't need a light box. I make these dark enough that you don't need a light box. And so these are my pieces to the rainbow. I'm now going to number three. You can label them one, two, three, four four, five, and six. One, two. I'm a little bit OCD. And then I'm going over just a little bit past the line because this is gonna overlap. So I'm making my pieces slightly wider than what you see. And I'm going to create a composite. Like I said, leave a little extra margin. Yes, metallic thread along the lines of the rainbow sounds delicious. Sounds absolutely delightful. That's number five. Make it a little bit wider. And then go number six. And do the same thing. So those are all my rainbow pieces, right? And they're labeled one through six. You can write what color you want on them. Sometimes that helps. So when I'm sewing, it helps to do, you know, things in order. So if this is the order of my rainbow, the one, two, three, four, five, six. So one of these greens might have to go. Maybe it goes in this order. Or maybe I leave the two greens and I leave it like that. So I might just do it like that and have two greens since it's St. Patrick's Day. And so I go one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to go red, orange, yellow, green one, green two, and blue and so that's going to be my rainbow and it really helps when you label stuff this that i'm using is uh heat and bond light is what i'm using this is pelon heat and bond light also known as i think pelon 805 all right, so I have these little guys, this part of the rainbow. I'm gonna chop in between. I don't need a huge margin because these are actually wider than what I need them to be. So I'm just gonna trim them. And this is a great use of leftover jelly roll strips, friends. All right, 
So rainbow segment one. Use parchment paper. Do not get it confused with fusible because you will have a disaster on your hands. Very disastrous. So now that you have that, you can take your jelly roll strips and on the wrong side of the fabric, you're gonna put all of the pieces. I'm gonna flip them over and red is number one. Oops, there's a nose. I don't press it a lot. Some people press it a lot. I just press it until the you can tell that the glue has melted slightly. And I use junky scissors for this. The next one is my orange, number two. Don't kill the glue, friends. Just press it just a little, just a few seconds, like 15 seconds. All right. Next is yellow. If you ever get glue on your iron, the best way to get it off is to use a dryer sheet. If you have a dryer sheet, you can take it and put it, put it on a towel and then take your iron that has all the glue on it and just iron that dryer sheet. It will get all that nasty glue right off your iron. these in my lap. Do you guys ever lose things in your sewing room? Sometimes you've got a million things going on. This one here is parchment paper. It is not freezer paper. Freezer paper has a glossy side. So this is freezer paper. It has a really shiny side with wax and it has a dull paper side. So that's freezer paper. I use this for something else. I used that in February when I did the birdhouse. This is parchment paper that you find in the baking aisle, and it's to keep stuff from sticking. So, green one. Like I said, quickly, about 15 seconds, not a lot. Because the more times you press, the more you um, use up that glue, and so I want to make a composite, and so I'm trying not to abuse my glue. And do I save pieces this tiny? Probably not, unless I'm gonna do something needle turn with them that's really small. But if you're crumb quilting, you can save those. All right, so now I need green number two. And keep these in order, friends, because they can get really confusing really quick. So I always do rainbow segment one and then rainbow segment two. Okay. Let's move that out of the way. And then last but not least is this one. So that's blue. Anytime that you are doing applique, which is the starch method like I did in February, I like to lay my pieces on a diagonal because that bias allows you to turn pieces easier. The same with needle turn applique. 
If you um, lay your pieces on the bias, it makes it easier to turn, especially curves. Okay, so now that I have this, I'm gonna go ahead and snip them away, but I'm gonna leave a margin. If you notice, I'm not cutting too close because I'm gonna make it wider than what it needs to be. So I've got this. The top of the rainbow I will make more exact. The bottom will have some wiggle room because the bottom will tuck underneath the pot of gold. So if you notice, these are going to be coming out of the pot of gold. So we're gonna leave that here. So there's blue. I'm gonna leave the paper so that I know what order that they go in. So who's getting your gnome quilt, friends? Are you keeping it for yourself? Are you giving it to somebody you love? Are you making the blocks individually for presents or pillows or mug rugs? What are you doing with all the little gnomey guys that we've got going on? Yes, the segment, the, the second segment of the rainbow does look like it could be a mermaid tail for a mermaid gnome if you wanted to turn one of your girl gnomes into a mermaid gnome. We're going to have more girl gnomes appear in our quilt. And I also have some special Christmas things that we're going to have. A pickup truck and a sleigh and... So once we do the first set of gnomes, the first six months, then we're going to be adding lots of other things to the Gnomius project. So you'll be able to make a Christmas-only gnomes uh, quilt when you're done with all of this, and you're going to be able to do a gnome of the month quilt as well. So William and Amy says making individual wall hangings, not sure yet. All right, so why am I using parchment paper this time? I'm using parchment paper because that enables me to group together several pieces of a fusible item and pre-fuse them together before I put them down on my finished uh, block, right? All right, so all of these little pieces are cut out like this. And now if you notice, this one is wider, right? And so I'm gonna take and I'm gonna nest the next piece on top of this one like this. And I'm gonna leave it like that. So I'm gonna fuse this edge down, right? And so I'm going to take this and I'm going to score it just a little bit so that it comes off. And I'm going to fuse this piece to the one that goes underneath it, which is the red. So the red piece goes first and then the yellow goes on top of it just like this. Next, I'm gonna get the next color, which it helps to put them in order, right? So this is five, four, pay attention, right? Orange is two, yellow is three. 
easily confused. Anybody else? All right. Yep. Oh, and that one, did you see how it, it didn't get pressed enough? So I just need to give it a little press because it won't release. And I'm gonna let that cool down because it's number two. I'm gonna put it in order. Orange goes next, then yellow, then green four. I'll score that. There it goes. Sometimes it helps to score it with a pin or a needle. And just gets it paper back right off of there. There it goes. If you don't press it enough, it won't release. If you press it too much, you kill the glue. So you really have to follow the manufacturer's instructions for that. These little guys make great tea towels, so if you're doing a tea towel project or a tote bag, these little guys fit on just about anything. That's why I made them eight and a half by 11. So they would fit, the entire block can fit within an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It also allows you to print them out um, easily on a regular printer. Sometimes it just doesn't want to come off, so you've got to score it pretty good to get that paper off. There you go. Anybody else struggle with their little tiny pieces? Um, for the rainbow, I'm pulling all of the pieces off because I'm going to fuse them together. So this one will go on top of here. If you notice, this one still has the paper, the red. Then this goes on top, just like that. Then goes the yellow, just like this. And I don't want you to worry about perfection because it's going to be okay if you're not perfect. This should be hanging out like this because we're going to trim that later, right? When we match the other rainbow piece, then we're going to trim this. So I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to lay this on top, just like this. I'm just kind of checking that they're relatively evenly spaced. Like I said, they don't have to be perfect, but they're relatively evenly spaced. I'm going to add green number five. And just to recap what I'm doing, I've pulled the paper off of all of them except the very first one. That one stays on. And I'll pull that off when I get ready to attach the entire thing to my, my background. Okay, so now my rainbow just needs one more piece, and this is the piece on the outside. If you notice, this is the piece on the outside, so it has extra. 
and then it has some right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna trim this down closer to the size that I need it to be. And I'm gonna go on that line and it's more exact. So I left some wiggle room on those middle pieces, but this outer piece I want it to be more exact because I don't want a bunch of excess. All right, so I trimmed that. And now I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna leave this because I can trim that off. All right. So I'm taking this off. And if you notice, some of my fusible does not want to come off. Some of this fusible has been in my sewing room a little bit. And when fusible gets old, it doesn't stick very well. All right. There we go. My rainbow has the order I want. I'm going to measure this right here to make sure it's the correct width. And so I'm going to lay my paper right here. And the bottom of that rainbow should sit right at three inches. So I'm going to use a ruler. Let's see if I have a ruler close by. The bottom of that rainbow should be three inches across. So I'm going to lay that ruler here. And I'm going to make sure that my rainbow It's three inches across the bottom. And that's about right, right there. So now that I know my rainbow is three inches across the bottom, I'm gonna pull this down just a hair. Lay this here. Now I'm gonna give it a little trim. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna press together. Just like that. So there's the rainbow. I'm gonna let it cool so that I can peel it off the parchment paper. But if you notice, this first one still has the paper. Still has the paper. And this now, ha all of it has glue. Okay, if I'm going to needle turn, this particular piece and I can if I want to now that it's all one piece I could now needle turn this but these raw edges in here would have to be sewn right so I'm going to sew in here with some very beautiful metallic thread so I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to sew with some metallic thread but now this is ready. I'm gonna leave this one on and I'm gonna take this one off right before I fuse the entire thing. All right, so we've got a little bit of time. I've got the gold that's gonna fit right there. And look, my rainbow is the correct size. And I have my little pot that it's gonna come out of. So I will fuse from the back of the design to the front of the design. So this is the back. I can fuse this on top of here, and then I can fuse the pot of gold on top just like this. And when I quilt this, I will actually quilt it to make it look like coins. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna quilt circles. And so that's the gold that's peeking out of my, my pot of gold. I could leave it like this, but I want my rainbow to bend back the other way and I want the little cloud. And so this is like a little metallic cloud that's gonna go on mine. And so I would do the same thing with the other part of the rainbow. I would simply just trace it with a little bit of fusible web and this is where all those tiny pieces, if you save them, they can come in handy. Quickly do the same thing. This is the little piece. Scooch over.
switch over and I label them one, two. And so I go one, two, three, four, five, six. And it just helps me to keep track. And then I scooch over and that's three. Four, a little tiny sliver is number five. And then a little tiny chunk of a piece is number six. And I have my six pieces and I do the same thing that I did before to build that composite. Somebody said, would it be better to do the coins before attaching the pot? Yes, I will definitely attach the coins to the rainbow before I attach the whole pot. There we go. Those are my little pieces to the other segment of the rainbow. I'm leaving just a tiny bit in between these. to follow my colors that I had before. I'm just going to put them in order. So I'm going to move my pressing mat over here so that I don't make a big mess of my surface. And I'm going to go back in order. So red will be number one. And it fits right there in the crook. And I just hold it for 15 seconds. And goes orange. I look for my little number two. And then we have yellow. So that should be number three. So somebody else is married to a James, huh? No, I have not used the fusible interfacing yet. Just like that. Now I'm going to lay the green. And that's number four. Little tiny pieces here. And this is number five. And so that rainbow fits in those weird little spots I left. Oop, there we go. I almost thought I ironed the gluey side. Have you guys ever done that, ironed the gluey side? All right. Somebody said, what materials am I using? All of the materials that I use in all of these are listed on the website. There's a column that says machine applique and there's a column that says hand applique. And those are the same materials that I use every single time that I have class. So there's nothing extra that's on that list. Okay, so now we go chop. Chop. Choppity chop. Anybody else talk to themselves when they cut? All right. 
And there we have it. And I have a little cart that I keep all of my sewing supplies on for a project, and that's my project cart beside me. Okay, same with these little guys. I'm going to be uh, building the composite and then sticking it on my interfacing. So now that I have this, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with this little rainbow. So again, just like that other one, I'm going to leave one with the paper on it. I'm going to remove the paper from the other ones. Hi Susie, um, the free pattern is on the website and it is also on the Facebook page for our uh, Jelly Roll Club. So if you go to www.jellyrollclub.com you can find the patterns there and you can also find them on our Facebook page by searching at Jelly Roll Club on Facebook. And when this is done, I'm also going to post it on Pinterest so you can find it on Pinterest if you can't find it in those other locations. Because not everybody has social media, so I try to post it as many places as I can. There we go. And unlike other websites where you get a short tutorial, my websites are literally an entire lesson from start to finish so that you see the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between that goes into creating these pieces. All right. All right, friends, we're getting close here to put together a composite rainbow so you guys can see how it goes together. All right, and then last but not least is this little guy. All right, if you have not uh, done this before, let me just tell you that it can be very easy to pull all the, the paper off and then all of a sudden glue your surface. So I can't tell you how many times when I was a newbie at Fusible or Applique that I put glue on the surface of one of my things and then of course that made me super sad. Okay, let me move all of this, let me get the gold. I don't wanna, here's my pot. There we go. Now we can put, oop, there's James's nose. Hey. We'll save that for later. All right. So now that we have the pot down here at the bottom, and we have our rainbow bend number one, we have our gold that goes inside the pot. And I checked that so that measures three inches across the bottom. I have my cloud, and it still has the paper on the back. It it's a metallic cloud because that's the cloud that takes us to the end of the rainbow. All right, so now we have to start again. And so I'm gonna leave the paper on number one. And the next color is number two, which is orange. And in this case, I'm going backwards. So the number three is yellow. So let me take the paper off of here. Little tiny pieces. If you have arthritis, this can be kind of hard on your fingers a little bit when you're messing with little tiny pieces. There we go. Actually, he's going on top. 
All right. Now the yellow. Score that with your scissors, score that with a needle, your nail. If you have nice sharp fingernails, I don't. I file my fingernails. Put the next piece on there. Where's number four? Yes, this one. Do you ever write? On your uh, papers and then cannot read your own writing? I do that from time to time. Goodness gracious. Somebody said, this is making so much sense now. Well, I hope I'm making sense. Every now and again, I have a senior moment and I forget what I'm doing, but. I try to make sense of what's happening. Flip around, little friend, flip around. And this should be going down the hill, so to speak. I'm going to trim this in a second and it'll make sense. Did I trace that piece correctly? I hope so. If not, don't worry, that top will get trimmed. trend okay don't worry it looks weird but it'll make sense in a minute so I've got all the paper off of there let me get the tiny paper off of here there you go very fiddly little piece here Yeah, I'm very OCD about making sure that I have all of my pieces in order before I fuse them. And maybe it's just me, but I find that it works better and I make less boo-boos that way. So if you're slightly on the OCD side, this is a great hobby. And one of the things that's very frustrating, or was very frustrating when I was a new quilter, is when I would get patterns, that we're missing a bunch of steps. And then I did not know what to do. So I try to not do that to you guys by providing as many steps as possible. There we go, okay. So I'm gonna measure this little rainbow here and see how wide this top of this rainbow is. So the top of this rainbow is about an inch and a fourth and the bottom of this rainbow is right at an inch and three quarters. So I'm going to try to shoot for an inch and a fourth and an inch and three quarters. It needs to look like a little fan, right? So I'm going to bring this over. I'm going to put this like this. Put this like that. And I'm going to measure it. And that's about an inch, so that means I need to spread this out just a hair. Just a tiny bit. Bring that green back. Pinch that blue in place like this. And try to make sure that you don't have any gaps. 
And now I'm going to take my iron and I'm going to press this entire segment of the rainbow, just like this. Remember that that first one still has paper. All right, so I'm going to let that cool down. I keep little bits from my project in a bag like this. So if you notice, I have leftover hearts that I made from the inside of a heart that I cut out. And I save all my bits. This is a tree that I'm gonna use later. So I save all my bits in a little Ziploc bag. And so rainbow should be cool. And let's see, ah, there we go. It's peeling right off just the way I like. And it has the back side. And so this rainbow is going to be going up and down, right? So this rainbow on mine is going to be going one way and then the other. Did I, did I do the rainbows the correct way? I sure hope so. Okay, so my rainbow is gonna go this way and then it's gonna go that way. So I need to trim this rainbow, right? My rainbow is gonna go just like this. So it's gonna go down one side and back the other. Does that make sense? And my cloud here. Let me look at my image. Do I even have my image? Goodness gracious, I hate when I do that. You ever lose something and you're like, which way does it go? All right. That's all right, friends. Live TV. Here we go. All right. So the cloud will peak. So this peaks underneath there, and I have to trim it. And then this cloud will peak underneath here. So my cloud comes like this, and it goes on top. Ugh. Like this. So the rainbow goes up one way, and down the other. And apparently, I made my rainbow too wide and so now it's not gonna fit. So I'm just gonna cut a different cloud and that's okay. It's supposed to fit like this, right against it. Oh, I guess it does fit, there it goes. So the rainbow goes under here, just like that. And it goes down one side and up the other. Am I making sense with this little rainbow? I was getting directionally challenged, my friends, directionally challenged. So I'm gonna mark this with a pencil and I'm gonna trim that off. So I'm gonna mark this just like this with a little line, oops. So I'm gonna add this to the composite how this baby should fit like that. Does that make sense? The little cloud is peeking out from underneath the rainbows. And this cloud is gonna need trimmed a little bit. So I'm just trimming the edges because I made it too long when I traced my pattern, which can happen. And now it's gonna fit the way I want it. It should overlap, have a little gap, and then your cloud should fit right inside there. All right, now that we have this the way we want it, I'm going to press this where I want to hold it with a little bit of fusible. So now the two, this cloud is holding on to that, right? So I'm going to let it cool. And don't try to lift it before it cools, friends, and it does that. Okay. I've got this composite. I've got that composite. 
I'm going to peel this middle one out now because I don't need it. So let me let it cool. And I can put the entire thing now interfaced underneath so that it won't um, shift on me when I sew. So when I'm sewing this, I'm going to want to have interfacing underneath all of this because this can shift on you and you can have all kinds of problems with your little pieces getting chewed up in the machine or not sitting the way you want them to. So I'm going to pull this off, this last row here. And so whenever I have something that has a bunch of little tiny skinny pieces like this, I always like to use interfacing. All right. We are getting close here. And somebody said, is the big one in the wrong order? Uh, no. The rainbow bends, and so it ends on red, and it should start on red again. All right. All right, I made my red. All right. This is going to sit at an angle, so I'm going to curve it like this. I'm going to trim it. This will fit underneath there like that. And then I'm going to trim across this part, so I want my rainbow to come like this. Does that make sense? I want my rainbow to go up, you don't see it, and then it curves back down, and that's why the rainbow is like this because when a rainbow bends, if you notice these are the two pieces, and you break that in half, and you don't see the arched part, that's why the red goes down the back. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna get that part ready. I'm gonna put the gold and I'm gonna fuse it to the bottom of this rainbow. So now the gold gets fused to the rainbow right here at the bottom. Let it cool. Tuck it underneath. Press this together. Give it a chance to cool and then I'm going to trim across here and I'm going to make a curve. Now that I'm done with all of that, I'm going to be interfacing this. So I'm going to be interfacing this entire thing because I'm going to glue baste it down when I sew so that I won't get a bunch of puckers in my rainbow. So now that I have my rainbow, I'm going to take and I'm going to trim across and bring that down just like that. And my rainbow's going to curve just so. 
And there's my rainbow. So you can see some of this through the cloud and I don't like to see that through the cloud. Normally I interface. So I'm gonna peel this back some and I'm gonna take some of this off of that cloud because I don't like that you can see all of that fabric through my cloud. I'm gonna trim that back just like that with my duckbill scissors. I'm gonna peel this back just like that while it's still malleable. And I'm not messing with the glue on the outside and I'm gonna take that and trim that off. And that way you don't see as much on the other side. There we go. You don't have all that haloing that goes on the back side of it. Okay, so now I'm going to take this where I drew that on my interfacing and I'm going to put this entire thing on some interfacing like that and I'm going to take a little piece and go the other direction and the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to glue baste it down and then I'm going to stitch the entire thing so I'm going to put this downward I'm going to cover it inside this parchment paper so that I'm not getting it all over my iron and I'm pressing it down so I can trim it. And I'm going to let it cool. And I'm liking how that rainbow is turning out. So I've got interfacing now on this. Not all of it, that still has some glue, and I'm gonna trim that off. I'm gonna take some of the excess, and I'm gonna be trimming it off. And now that ensures that my rainbow stays nice and flat and pretty when I get ready to stitch him down. I still have some glue over here. I was going to put a little bit more interfacing, but I actually don't need it for this piece. And that interfacing, you just have to make sure that you trim it off. You won't even see it when you sew it on. This can stay because it's going underneath the black cauldron, a little pot of gold, and I'm just going to trim this off. And that interface ensures that, it's fusible interface, it ensures that my entire rainbow stays together and when I sew it, it's not puckery and, and yucky. Let's trim it all off. And there's my rainbow. I don't like how this cloud is curving, so I'm going to curve it some more. And feel free to fix your stuff the way you want it to look. All right. Like I said, now I've removed all the paper. This still has glue. This has interfacing on the back. And now This entire thing has paper fusible. When I decide where I want to fuse it, I'm going to fuse the entire thing down when I decide where I want it on my block. So that is how you create a composite applique with fusible. Like I said, this cloud has a little bit of gold and the rainbow goes up and then it comes back down. And so that's 
why it is the way that it is. I have Handsome James, who's going to be next to my rainbow. So on my background, I'm going to put Mr. Handsome James. I'm going to give them a little bit of grass to stand under because, of course, he's from the Emerald Isle. He's from Ireland. And it's going to be about a half inch from the bottom is where he's going to go. If I wanted to, I could put James on this side and the pot of gold beside him on this side. So you can play with this however you want it. I don't like how close this is to the edge, so I'm probably going to swap and put James over here. He needs his shoes. Make sure that I'm at least a half inch from the side, a half inch from this side, so that when I get ready to add my sashings that I won't run into any problems. And I think the rainbow is going to be like this next to James's hat. I think I'm happy with that. And so I'll get to finish fusing all of this down at a later date. And like I said, I will sew his hat on first because he's in the back. I can always make his hat come to the front. But either way, I think my little d handsome devil is gonna look really good. Of course, he's gonna get a nose and he's gonna get a belt buckle and a pair of shoes but I think that my guy is gonna look really cute. I don't know, what do you guys think? Yeah, James, James is getting a nose and he's definitely has a pair of shoes floating around here somewhere. I had them at the beginning of the lesson, but they're probably on the floor. Yep, ta-da, found them on the floor. So James will get a pair of shoes that match his cauldron. And I'll sew all of this down, and I can either sew it down around the edges by hand after I fuse this, or I can sew them by machine. And so that is James, the Happy St. Patrick's Gnome. Like I said, I can put the cloud behind him. I can put the cloud next to him. But I think I like this little guy. All right, friends, I will see you guys in just a few weeks because we are going to be working on our April gnome. For the April gnome, I'm gonna be teaching you guys how to add three-dimensional elements to your gnomes because we're gonna have lots of flowers um, and little Eastery things that we're adding and maybe even a bunny rabbit or two. And so I can't wait to see you guys again. So this is my handsome fella. If you have not watched the other videos, please go back and watch. All of the patterns are linked at www.jellyrollclub.com. Um, I appreciate everyone who came today. Please feel free to drop questions on our Facebook page or in uh, the comment section below the video. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, like, leave a comment. I answer all those questions and I read all of your emails. Thank you so much for another fantastic Sunday. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye, friends. I'll see you guys later, okay?